last Sunday in the season after Epiphany. Epiphany is itself not really a season in the church life. But the last Sunday before Lent, we read the story of our Lord's transfiguration. This year we're reading that from Matthew's account. And that is found in chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What going on in this passage? We have Epiphany and Theophany. Are you familiar with what an Epiphany is? We've talked about Epiphany for weeks now. What's Epiphany? In the life of the church, it's the time we recognize Thank you, Debbie. Stand up and do that. We got a visual. Yeah, you could do that for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone, let's all do that together. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a light bulb going on. It's the moment when something is revealed and something is explained and something is made clear. That's epiphany. Epiphany being in the church, the time when we remember those travelers from the east coming, following the light of the star, when Jesus, the infant king, was revealed to them. Not Jews, but people who should have been expecting the Messiah, but nearly missed him when he came, because they were looking for a warrior and a king, someone with an army who was going to throw Rome out of the promised land and reclaim it for God's chosen people. But throughout scripture, we have things called theophanies, times when God is revealed and made manifest to the people. Now, God, other than in Jesus, usually comes in ways that do not seem necessarily earthly or understandable. How did, what was the theophany that Moses had on the bush? How did God appear to Moses then? The flames of the bush that was burning but was not consumed, and God spoke. Now, when God led the people through the wilderness, how did God appear to them then? During the day, God appeared as what? A cloud that moved ahead of them. And at night, how did God appear to them? Fire. You got this. Those are theophanies. And now we have sort of the greatest theophany of all, the transfiguration. Jesus calls his disciples away up the mountain and is transfigured before them, a word that really is hard for us to understand. I don't think Jesus was changed on the mountain. I think the disciples who went with him were changed. I think their eyes were open and they were able to see what they had only just guessed at before, or grasped at, or tried to understand. They saw him in his glory, and with him, great symbols of their faith, Elijah. Now, remember how Elijah left the scene when he was called by God? Chariot swoops down and takes him. You know, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Elijah leaves that way, which is why to this day, when the Passover comes and Jewish families gather around the Seder table, there will be an empty seat left for Elijah because before the coming of the Messiah in his fullness and with his kingdom, Elijah is expected to return. As is Moses in the fulfillment of time. Moses, the one who bears the law to us, the one who led the people for 40 years in the wilderness. So we have Moses and Elijah and Jesus kind of glowing there. And the disciples, remember who they are. They are ordinary, everyday folk. They are fishermen. 
They are not educated scholars in the law of faith, but they are people who took their faith seriously. They are people who believed that Jesus was the manifestation of God in their midst. And they see this sight that no one ever gets to witness, and what do they do? They go nuts. They don't know what to do, and they got to do something. So Peter, being the big, burly fisherman that he is, says, well, got to do something here. And he says, let me build us some houses. Let me build us some tents. Let me put up a tabernacle. Now remember, when Moses was traveling in the wilderness, was there a temple then? No. Every time they went someplace, the cloud of God's presence would descend when they set up those tents of the tabernacle so they would know that God was there in the traveling temple until the time when the temple was built and God's presence was known to be there. And God speaks to them. God's own voice speaks to these simple, ordinary men. They've been with Jesus and they've, they've hoped that he was the one. They've hoped he was the Messiah, the anointed one of God. They hoped that this might be God's actual son. But they hear the voice saying what the voice had said when Jesus was baptized by his cousin John when he came up out of the water and the dove descended on him in bodily form, the Holy Spirit, and said, this is my son, the beloved. And this time it's great because God knows that these men, in their confusion and probably their terror, don't know what to make of this. And what does he say? This is my son, my beloved. And what do you say to your kids when they're acting up? Listen to him. Listen to him. I borrowed my sermon title this morning from the Reverend Jack Vineyard, whose funeral I preached just a few months ago. It's ironic. I was his pastor after he retired, but he was my pastor in every sense of the word. And this was a sermon that he preached for me when I had mononucleosis and was unable to fulfill my preaching responsibilities. I was unable to get up out of the chair those days. And he called me up and he said, this is my sermon for Transfiguration Sunday. Don't just do something, stand there. It's the opposite of what we're told most of the time, isn't it? Aren't we called to do and be busy and busy and do and do and do and do? We identify ourselves by the work that we do, by the work that we accomplish, by the things we check off our list. I was talking to somebody this morning who had done many loads of laundry yesterday. You've had days like that, haven't you? When you think you have a day off and instead you're cleaning house, you're running errands, you're doing all that, and you get so busy that you don't have time for Sabbath or rest. But what does God say? Listen to him. Now, there's a lot of debate going on in the church these days, not this congregation, but every congregation, about what it is to be a disciple. Worship is getting harder for people to attend. Barry's not back there running the PowerPoint this morning because he's having to work overtime, which means he's missing church on Sunday. We've all had experiences like that, haven't we? Other than me, because I never get called in to work on Sunday. <laughs> I'm already here. But sometimes we are so busy in the doing, and there are folks who are saying, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. How many of you believe you don't have to go to worship to be a Christian? I'm going to disagree with you, and I think you do. I think you have to go to church because you are the church. Do you have to go to church and worship to be saved? Absolutely not. Salvation is based on the grace of God and Jesus Christ that claims us and takes us home. But we are the church. We're the body of Christ. And there is a debate going on, well, I worship God better if I'm on a mission trip, or I worship God better if I'm working in a soup kitchen, or I worship God better. I believe all those things are true, because I don't think that we can separate the response that we have to God, which is the outpouring of our hearts, the outpouring of our works. That's not what secures our salvation. But if we do not make time to stop and listen, then we can be so overwhelmed with busyness that we miss the presence and power of God in our midst. So what does Jesus say? Let's read that again. God says, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. I think I would be too if God specifically said to me, hush up, Terry. And just stand there for a moment. They fall to the ground. And then Jesus, in the manifestation of God with us, does what? He touches them. He touches them. They are touched by the hand of their God. And he says to them, get up and do not be afraid. He's going to go down the mountain and he's going to head toward Jerusalem and the end of his life. He's going to climb another hill, the one we don't like to think about. Even during the season of Lent, we don't like to think about the hill that he had to climb carrying his own cross. But scripture is full of hills and mountains and some valleys as well. Moses went up that mountain, and Moses was transfigured in a sense. His face, we didn't read that part, but his face was so changed by his encounter face-to-face with God that from then on he wore a veil. And we know what they did while he was up the mountain, right? Did they wait patiently for him to come down with God's law? No, they went off in another direction because they thought he was gone so long, surely he must have died. And they make for themselves a calf out of gold. And they say, this will be our God. That's what happens if you just can't be still for a while and wait. We're about to enter the season of Lent. It's a tough time because we are called to look into our own hearts and to recognize the ways that we have disappointed God. Not so that we feel guilty. Guilt is a waste of time and emotion and energy. Let me tell you that right now. And I've said this so many times in sermons and in individual conversations and Bible studies and lessons. Christ did not just come to take away our sin. He came to take away the guilt. Have you ever said to yourself or heard someone say, I know God forgives me, but I cannot forgive myself? That's allowing guilt to take precedence over the presence and the redemption and the power of God to forgive us once and for all in Jesus Christ. But Lent calls us away to a time of being quiet before God so that God may speak to us and that God and Jesus Christ may reach out his hand and touch us and say, do not be afraid. And then, and only then, can we get up and follow. Follow the God who is the cloud of presence by day, the fire that we understand is the Holy Spirit now, that guides us through the darkest night. The voice that comes and speaks to us in our heart. But mostly the hand that touches us and says, do not be afraid. Can you imagine what the church of Jesus Christ would look like? Can you imagine what the community around us in Baltimore County would look like? Can you imagine what the world that God has given us to love and enjoy and care for would look like? If only we would stop and listen, feel the touch of Christ, and then go into the world unafraid. There would be no stopping us then. So I hope this Lent you will take the opportunity to stop and listen for God, that you will receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that God in Christ alone can bring to your life so that on Easter morning you wake up unafraid and go into the world to proclaim your Savior by everything you say and everything you do to the power and glory of his holy name. Amen.